I'm going to start with verse 1 and following of Joshua, the fifth chapter. <clears throat> so it was when all the kings of the Amorites who were on the west side of the Jordan and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard that the Lord had dried up the water of the Jordan from before the children of Israel until we had crossed over, that their hearts melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the children of Israel. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. I know the men at least are saying have mercy. So Joshua made flint knives for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of foreskins. It's in the word right here. And this is the reason why. Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. For all the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the wilderness, listen to me, church, on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the people who were men of war who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers. Thank you, church. That he would give us a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 7. Then Joshua circumcised their sons, whom he raised up in their place. For they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. So it was, when they had finished circumcising all the people, that they stayed in their places in the camp till they were healed. Verse 9 says, then the Lord said to Joshua, this day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. Therefore, the name of this place is called Gilgal to this day. The title of my message, The Final Cut. The Final Cut. Seek the Lord in prayer. Take my mind. will and mold it to yours and speak to your people in Jesus name. The children of Israel have gone through and for the few moments that I am taking, your, your real speaker is coming and I am happy to say what I need to say and get out of the way, just setting the tempo and template here. But Joshua and the children of Israel have been on that 40-year journey going from Egypt to the promised land. It does not take 40 years to get from Egypt anywhere. <laughs> so they've been traveling in circles because God made a promise and God keeps his promises. Amen? Amen. Even the negative ones. And God promised that the children of Israel who came out of Egypt would not step foot in the promised land. So for 40 years, they traveled. Now, in the meantime, all things went the way normally things go, and people were getting married, and they were getting married on the road, and people were having children on the road, and children were growing up on the road, and school was going on on the road for 40 years. Get the picture. This is what's taking place. And now the children of 
of Israel, the Bible says, are now under new management. Joshua has taken up where Moses left off. You remember, Moses was faithful enough to get them to the borders of the promised land, but the people rebelled against him. They rebelled against God, said, we're not able, we're not worthy, we can't do it. Listen to what they said. They said, we are grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we are grasshoppers in the eyes of the king. And as a result, God sent them back in the desert for 40 years. Now Joshua comes on the scene. Just want to set the table, and we'll get into this. Joshua comes on the scene. Joshua lead, leadership is not like Moses. Joshua comes and says, I am not your last pastor. <laughs> I need to make it real for you. I need to make it real. But we get comfortable and we say, you know, well, Pastor so and so always did it this way. That's not my name. Joshua's doing something completely different. And, and he marches them up, and the Red Sea experience that was there for the generation before Joshua now becomes a Jordan River experience for Joshua. And they cross over. Meanwhile, the Canaanites have been looking at this whole thing, and their last hope, They've been getting more and more fearful as the children of Israel get closer because they know with Israel comes their own judgment. And they've been hoping that we can stave them off until we can call for some help by the fact that the children of Israel have got to stay on the other side of the Jordan River. It's at swelling stage. There's no way they can come over. But God opens up the Jordan River and the children of Israel walk across on dry land. And the battle, listen to me, the battle is now over. Did you read verse 1? It says that all the kings of the Canaanites no longer had any strength left. There has not been one arrow shot. There has not been one battle cry announced. There has not been one sword drawn. And already the battle is over. Because if you know anything about competition, if you take a man's heart, the battle is over. If he doesn't believe he can win, the battle is over. Victory is all but for the taking. And when Joshua marches in with the sons of of the men he came out of Egypt with. I want to get the picture. Because we realize Joshua and Caleb are the two oldest cats in the entire nation of Israel. They are the only ones left. God laid to rest everybody that they came out of Egypt with. These are the only two, Caleb and Joshua. They are the statesmen. They are the seniors. And, and I want to pause to say something about that. As it was then, oftentimes it is now. One of the problems that men face, especially minority men, is that we die on the way to the promised land. We don't make it. We don't make it. The stress of life the way we live our lives, the way we don't take care of ourselves, the way we sacrifice our lives, or the fact that we never were a part of the family in the first place. We are not there. So when you go to the typical family reunion, you hear Big Mom, who is the matriarch, but nobody ever talks about Big Pop. Because Big Pop is not around. We're fortunate to have a few Caleb's and Joshua's that last for us to get into the promised land. I need you to understand this as we're dealing with our men. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to drop. Then you're going to hear some stuff that's going to make you scratch your head. You're going to hear some things today that are going to really shake you up a little bit. They are gonna be, some of them are going to be controversial, so you might as well understand. We're trying. We are dying out. In and outside the church, we as men are dying out. 
And there's a reason for it. And some of this is outlined here. Furthermore, when the men die out, it makes it hard for men coming behind to understand what true manhood is. Because they have no examples. So for the children of Israel, there are only two who understand. There are only two who are alive going across the Jordan River who know what the Red Sea looks like. And now they are on the other side of the bank. Everybody can see it. They can smell the, 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 the milk and honey. They can, they can look. Oh, it's glorious over here. They're excited. But before they take a step towards Jericho and anything in the promised land, God says to Joshua, hold up. Don't go nowhere yet. There's something that's got to take place before you take hold. I need you to take all the men. Get flint knives. Joshua, don't get two. You're going to need to get a whole lot of flint knives. Because I need you. The way the word is translated in the Hebrew, it's not get flint knives and have people circumcised. God says to Joshua, you get flint knives for you because you're the one who's going to circumcise all the men of Israel. And you've done the math. And you've done the math. Children of Israel came out over 1.5 million strong. And they've been growing in the desert. So now, Joshua has the responsibility of becoming a surgeon <coughs> for the most delicate surgery you could ever think about going into. I need you to get the optics on this. Some of you don't even know. Some children are asking, Mama, what's circumcision? And Mama doesn't want to tell you. So pastor's going to tell you as delicately as he can what circumcision is. Hold on to your hats. When a male child is born, there is a layer of skin that covers his most private area. And we don't think about it because in our culture, kids are circumcised at birth. I was on the phone earlier this morning with Brother Chris, who does sound for us in the back. And he's not here today because we had a baby boy over the weekend. I want you to keep them in your prayers. It, it was done by C-section. Mama and baby are doing fine, but keep them in your prayers. Now, I, I, I tell you that because that boy is already circumcised. We don't waste any time. They, they cut that layer of skin and peel it back. And the reason why they do it at birth, the reason why you do it early in life is because the nerves that are in that part of the body don't completely, aren't completely grown, so it does not hurt as much. Stay with me, church family. So you get it over with early and quick. If you're a man sitting here, you don't even remember being circumcised. If you do, you were running late. <laughs> that doesn't even come to your mind. Everything is always the way it is. Every time you go into the restroom, everything is always the way it is down there. I gotta be graphic because I, I, I need you to understand what's taking place here. I need you to be a little uncomfortable and it's all right. We're gonna get through this. We're gonna get through this. So, so, so now you've got a generation of men who this practice that was supposed to be done, and you didn't have doctors to do this. Normally, the responsibility of taking the circumcision knife to the baby's son was the job of his father. You know, this is before the days they let you into the birthing room. You know how those pictures are? You got the tent and the women are in there and the mother is, is in labor and the father is just walking back and forth and he's nervous when the cry comes. 
and they tell him it's a son. It's now his job to go in, name this child, and to perform the rite of circumcision. Are you understanding? You with me so far? Now, here's the thing about it. This is not just a tradition at this point in time. It is important obedience to God. I don't have time for you to go and look in the passage of scripture that's there. But if you look in Exodus chapter 3, or I believe it's chapter 4, when Moses finally makes up his mind, I will do what God says. I am going to Pharaoh. He is on his way to fulfill what God called him to fulfill. He says yes to God, yes to your will, yes to your way, and God almost kills him on the road. Go back and read it. Exodus chapter 4. It is Moses' wife who realized what's going on. And it's that Moses has not circumcised his son. So God gets so upset about this that he's ready to kill Moses for not doing this thing. And so to intervene, Moses' wife circumcised the children very quickly and, and throws those foreskins down at Moses' feet and said, look what you call You are a bloody husband to me. It's some word. Just go and look for it yourself. That's how important this thing is. And now we have an entire generation of men who the oldest of which are 40 years old who have not been circumcised. And they're on their way into battle for the Lord. So God says, I have already given you Canaan, but before you get in there, you gotta cut some. You gotta cut some. You gotta cut it. And then he goes through, and Joshua begins to explain what happened. Why is it there were no fathers who came out and did what they were supposed to do in the desert? I'm so glad that you asked. So glad that you asked. You know, your pastor gets excited and he leaves his notes. This is what this is the problem. Here's what the problem was. Verse 5. For all the people who came out had been circumcised. They were even circumcising while they were in bondage in Egypt. Are you understanding what's taking place? But all these people born in the wilderness on the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness till all the people who were men of war who came out of Egypt were consumed because they did not obey the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord swore that he would not show them the land in which the Lord had sworn to give to their fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. Please understand, circumcision is associated with obedience. It is an obedient act to God. When Abraham cut covenant with God, he immediately came home and circumcised every servant in his house. I heard one comedian say it like this, like, well, it, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute now. Did God say circumcise the foreskin or your skin? I need you to be clear on that. <laughs> but now God is so upset with the disobedience of these men that God suspends circumcision. You are too disobedient for me to allow you to circumcise your children. Y'all can roll with me as long as you roll with me, but I'm not letting you into the promised land and I will not suspend it. I don't want disobedient lifestyle and you look like you've been circumcised and serving the Lord. I'm not interested in it. I don't want it. I don't want you to have your Bible underneath your arm. I don't want you to come and give me your praises when you know you're not living right. And if I give you a command, your answer is not yes. As a matter of fact, not only do I not want it from you, I don't even want to see your son with it. 
not coming from you. Because you don't understand what circumcision means. You don't understand that I'm not interested in the skin. I'm interested in the heart. And what shows up on the outside is a manifestation of what you allowed me to do on the inside of your heart. And since I can't have your heart, I don't want the outside appearance. But now, all those men are gone. And you got men who are oldest 40 years old and younger. All the men of war. So we're not talking about babies. We're talking folks who can pick up a sword. Folks who have already been in battle. Joshua was the general. All the battles that were fought were fought by brothers who were uncircumcised. But now when you get to this part in the journey, God says, hold up. Before I give you the promised land, you're going to have to cut some stuff. And Joshua, I don't trust anybody else to do this but you. <laughs> so can you imagine what that must have been like? As one by one, every man of warfare age in the children of Israel comes to Joshua to get cut. Why? Why would God do this? What is the reason? What has God established? And more important, what that got to do with me? Because I ain't left nobody. Be good. Please understand, there is an intimacy that comes from somebody doing for you what your daddy should have done but didn't. come to Joshua, men, probably with families of their own, and they come to Joshua, and Joshua and each man in Israel become real intimate, real quick. Do you know what this represents? Joshua is the surrogate father for all of Israel. He's got to do something that if it had been done when they were little, it wouldn't have hurt. But they carried a childhood issue. And now it's on the borders of preventing an adult promise. Are you understanding me? Listen. Something happens in our country where we have more males than we have men. Please understand, just because you grow up and your muscles get swole and your voice drops does not make you a man. We have males who wear clothing and cologne and drive cars of men, but ain't no men. Why? Because something that was supposed to be addressed when they were little did not get cut. So the problem that could have been addressed as a child is now following them into adulthood and it threatens to disrupt the promise that God has in mind for their lives. <clears throat> Can I get real with you for a quick minute? Let me help you understand. They say that when a boy in his childhood, as he's growing and maturing both physically and emotionally, has a traumatic experience that takes place, what can happen to that boy is that physically he continues to grow. Mentally, he continues to grow. But emotionally, 
he stays at the exact same age as whatever trauma happened. And when it goes undetected, when it goes unaddressed, you have grown men who still act like they're 14. You got grown men who process stuff, who think you got leaders of companies. You got people who are quarterbacks on a football team. Help me, Holy Ghost. Grown men. On the screen, on the poster, and when they get finished playing basketball, they go back to their room and play boyhood games. Oh, what is that? And the realities are, if you go back through and you begin to check, you start to notice some things. Something happened. Something happened. Something's happened. And it doesn't necessarily mean you were assaulted, although many of us have been. And it got stopped. The emotion stopped right there. It could have been that's the year daddy left. The divorce happened. Dad walked out, said he was going to the store, and you haven't seen him, and it's been 15 years. That's where everything stopped. And you can't see it, because it doesn't show on the outside. I still went to college, still graduated, still got a degree, got a job. I was man enough to attract a girl. I got married. But it's something that's on the private part of my life. And it's stuck at seven. It's stuck at 12. It's stuck at 17. Are you listening to me, church family? And God says, God says, before I give you what I plan to give you, I got to address this thing. Because if I don't address it, you will be unfit. The reason why wow. the children of Israel couldn't go into the promised land the last time was not that God was not powerful enough to take them in. It's not that God needed 40 years to rev up his courage and, and take them over. The reason why God would not take them in is because what they spoke would come true. Life and death are in the mouth, are in the tongue. And what they said was, they look at us like grasshoppers. Let me stop right there and help you understand what that means. They were looking at everybody in Canaan as giants, and they saw themselves as grasshoppers. And how we have a tendency to see ourselves is how we think people see us. So if you think you're a grasshopper, guess what? You smell like a grasshopper. You walk like a grasshopper. You act like a grasshopper. And you have lack of bravery when it's on the line just like a grasshopper would. Your thought process is to jump and fly away. Ladies, are you understanding what it is I'm talking about? So when you talk to her, I can't understand why men hate commitment. We got grasshopper issues. And they cannot, they are not equipped. And here's what most ladies will try and do with their, with, their, with their male counterparts. Whether it is your husband, boyfriend, son, brother, you try and love him into being the man that you want him to be. And you can love a grasshopper as long as you want. <laughs> At the end of the day, he's still going to be a grasshopper. Wow. 
Because unless what happened is addressed and dealt with, now understand what takes place. And I'm not going to steal, I'm not going to steal Dr. Ed Miller's thunder as he's coming in. I, I'm going to leave him all that he needs in order to do it. Understand what takes place when you have generations, especially of young black men in this country who have all kinds of trauma, so much trauma that we have normalized the trauma. It's a part of life. When I, I'm 50, when I was in elementary school, I began to sit at the lunch table in public school, and I sat at the lunch table and began talking with my friends, only to find out that out of all the guys that were sitting at the table, only three of us had mom and dad in the house. They looked at us like there was something wrong with us. Your mom and daddy still live in the same house? Wow. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and so something that is a traumatic experience, the reason why many of us are saying, you know, I, I, don't, I don't remember very much trauma. I, I, my life has been pretty good. I, I really, it's been normalized. It's been one's life. Because you don't think of it as trauma when you go across the street and your best friend went through the same thing two years ago. That ain't nothing. Just suck it up. <laughs> and we never suck it up. We always suck it down. Huh. But you don't realize some portion of us is stuffs. We don't realize God intends for you to be whole, for you to accept fully what it is he's trying to give. Are you listening to me, church family? You don't believe me? Look at Joseph. Joseph. Did Joseph go through a traumatic experience? Everything about Joseph was sharp. He was well. He was intelligent. He, he knew his stuff. He loved the Lord. He was a man of principle. But before he could take full ownership, guess what God had to do? God had to bring back the same brothers who assaulted him so he could cut that portion and Joseph could grow to be full grown. Because it's a dangerous thing. It's a dangerous thing. How many of you got children under the age of eight? Raise your hand. Children under the age of eight? How many of you are willing to give them the keys to your car and put them behind the wheel on 75? You're not going to do it. Why? Because you're going to lose your car and your son. That's what happens when you are in a position that God has for you, but you are not fully grown yet. And that's why we have things like Enron that take place. That's why we are living in a day and age where there makes, it makes no sense what's going on. It's because trauma after trauma after trauma, folks have grown up to the place, men have grown up and left. It is okay, it is acceptable for us to leave the wholeness behind and limp into the promised land. And God said no. Here's the bad news. Cutting off from you is going to hurt. See, if it had been addressed when you were little, it wouldn't hurt so much. For some of you, the trauma was nobody told you no. If it had been addressed when you were little, it would have been no problem. If somebody had stopped you from terrorizing the school, Instead of laughing, it's <laughs> that, that lame statement that we give, that's a blanket statement. Boys will be boys. Replace it. Boys will stay boys. <laughs> Unless they get cut. Final. 
to picture them one by one. Men who barely knew Joshua come into Joshua's tent. Do you know how many flint knives he has to have? Did you hear what the word of God calls that spot? The Bible will call that spot for the rest of history Foreskin Hill. One by one. Come on, son. Come on in here. Don't back up. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you this ain't going to hurt. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you this is just going to pinch. But I'm here to let you know there is life on the other side of this cut. I'm here to let you know that this represents what God wants to do in your life. If you can submit to this, if you can submit to him, if you can go under the knife that he has in mind for your life, the promised land will be yours. And I commit to you, I will be there to walk you through it. I know your daddy messed up. I know he wasn't around. I know, I know. But if you will trust me here, where it's intimate. You see, when men get together, when women get together, and we finally get to a place where women trust one another, women will open up and talk to each other. When I feel comfortable, I feel safe, we'll start talking. We'll start talking about our relationships, we'll start talking about the hardships, and women will bond together. When men get together, and we feel comfortable, we watch football. <laughs> That's it. We never get to a place where anybody gets the chance to see who we really are. Not men. Not other men. I mean, maybe if you're my brother, you're my dad, maybe, but, but, but you know, that's, that's, that's completely unmanly, isn't it? That's what they told you, isn't it? So the results are, it gets to be repeated and cycled. Men's ministry is about the good news of Joshua chapter 5. Yes, it will hurt. Yes, it should have been done earlier. And yes, maybe there are some of us whose dads dropped the ball. The good news is God intends for you to get your promise in the promised land. The good news is you can still yet be a better husband to your wife a better father to your children, a better employee on your job, a better boss to those who are in charge. The good news is, even if I am a 40-year-old male, 50-year-old male, manhood is not outside my reach. But what it's going to take is you finding someone who you will allow close enough to cut you in intimate places. You know what that's called? Men's ministry. That's what men's ministry is supposed to be about. We dance about it because men get uncomfortable when you start talking about this kind of stuff. We dance about it because if you call a program that... that brings men into understanding. Let me ask questions of stuff that I don't understand, that nobody explained to me. Help me get through the ways and the turns of life. Help me. There's nobody in front of me that's leading me through. Oh yeah, we'll do that for the young people. We have mentors for the young people. That's good. And our mentors are 20-something years old. But who's the mentor for the 20-something year old? By that time, we're like, all right, you grown now. You grown now. All right, good. You made it? Yeah, you made it 25. Woo-hoo! And there are still turns of life. Who is it that's going to tell you when the strength that you used to use to get things done fails you? Who is it going to take you from the talented and strong rookie to the wily veteran that you need to be? as you play the game of life. That is the job that begins 
here in the church. Somebody, I got to trust enough to do the final cut. You know what the rewards are? They're the rewards. Promised land is the reward. <clears throat> Promised land is the reward. Do you know that Joshua, in the 40 years that he leads the children of Israel, not one time does any one of those jokers get up and try and stone him like they did almost weekly for Moses? Do you understand why? Do you understand why? Moses was the most patient man. He was one of the most intelligent men. He set up an entire nation. Just he and God. He wrote it out. He scripted it out. He gave them their history. He gave them their organization. He set up their religious practices all by himself. And every time that thing that did not get cut would raise up, they would get mad at Moses and try and stone him. Joshua, ain't nobody trying to stone Joshua. In the whole book, there is one stoning in the book of Joshua. And Joshua is on the other side of the rock. What is the difference? What is the difference? I'll tell you what the difference is. Foreskin Hill. 40 years, Moses couldn't even get him into the promised land. Joshua, he conquers all of Canaan in that time. What's the difference? Something got to get cut. And in order for that to happen, there needs to be a safe tabernacle where men can come and say, here is where I am. Here is what I'm struggling with. And i got to have folks who I can trust that will cut off stuff in my life. Help me with areas that have gotten so big they're going to follow me into the promised land. i got to have a safe place where I can say, I am struggling with pornography. I'm a good man. I love my wife. I love my children. But it's that thing that got started when I was 14, and I don't know how to get And it's overwhelming me. And it's my go-to place, and it's got to get cut. I'm struggling trying to get over alcohol. I'm a deacon. I'm, a, I'm, I'm working with the young people. But I'm struggling, and I don't want to come to church, and I don't want to tell everybody, because the Adventist church that I've known and grown up with all my life, I know what they do with me. They don't cut that which is missing from me. We'll just cut you off. We just kill you, Dad. Wow. If you don't know how to keep your secrets to yourself, we will get rid of you. Wow. You are dead weight. We have generations of that that are taking place right here in God's church. And you know what we call it? We are holding up the standard. Hmm. That's not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came. The praise team sang about it. I'm looking for brokenness. I don't have it all together. I got real issues and I need real solutions and I need real men that will walk alongside of me as I try and make it. As I get cut they all stayed together. Days. They stayed together. Days. As they began to heal. They said, see, it's not going to be a one-time situation. It's going to be a process that it is you got to go through. But I'm promising you, and you got to have people like Caleb and Joshua going from tent to tent, from men who are recovering to another group of men who are recovering. Hang in there. It's going to be bad for a while, but trust me, you will be better than you were before. Who does that job in the church of God? Men of God, I challenge you. 
to become a church where we don't think that because I said happy Sabbath to my brother that I encouraged him in the Lord. There is one more benefit. And this is the one that makes me shake my head just to think about it. But it's in verse 9. After Joshua did what God said, verse 9, take a look. And I'm going to close with this. Then the Lord said to Joshua, This day, I have rolled away the reproach from Egypt from you. This day. Did you hear that? I'm uncomfortable with the this day. They have been with God for 40 years. And God has been blessing them with the reproach of Egypt still on them. They have been the people of God. He has fed them manna from heaven. And they have the reproach still. They still smell like Egypt. Their bent was still towards Egypt. And here's the thing about it. You can want the bent gone. You can want the smell gone. Only God can get rid of the reproach. I need you to understand this. I need you to be shocked by this. Because these men, they were born on the way. They weren't even in Egypt. And they inherited the reproach. They got it through the bloodline. This day. What day is that? This day. Come on, God. When can I get this reproach off of me? When can I grow into manhood? This day is when I'm obedient enough to get cut. When I'm obedient enough to be a living sacrifice. So we've glorified living sacrifices. We make it sound like it's a wonderful thing. I make my life a living sacrifice. But then when God approaches you with somebody with a flint knife, you're like, bro, you better back up. <laughs> Here's the thing. The reproach does not leave until you are willing to submit. And the day that you do is the day the reproach gets rolled away. He called that place Gilgal. Gilgal means the weight has been rolled away. That's the challenge. That's what it is we're supposed to be doing. That's what this is all about. That's what the song that's being played really means. Take it, God. Take whatever it is. Cut it. I know it's been a part of me. I know it's going to change. I know it's going to hurt. I know I'm going to be weak. But it's not until I'm weak that I'm made strong. Is there anybody who's ready to be a man of God? The promise land is right there. You can see it. The victory is already, the, the victory, the final victory has nothing to do with what's outside. The final victory is not about what it is you're going to do in college. The final victory is not about the job that you're going to get. It's not outside. That's already been victorious. It's got your name on it. Where your battle is going to be. It's going to be here. Talking about making that transition. 
looking at my life and realizing there's stuff that got stuck and, I'm, and, 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 and I, I cover it. I spend my life covering it. I cover, I hover over it, but I'm giving that to God and saying, take it. <laughs> Cut it. Mold me. Transform me. Make me yours. Your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed. So I give you a challenge. Men's ministry means you line up in Joshua's tent. We're going to do some stuff. We're going to change our community. We're going to change with the dynamics that go on between us here in this church. I'm going to be a safe place for the person that comes next to me. I don't have it all together, so I'm going to need them to be a safe place for me. And we're going to talk. We're going to share. We're going to grow. We're going to become. We're going to make this place men of war ready to take the promised land going to take the first step. The first step doesn't happen at the walls of Jericho. The first step happens at Foreskin Hill. I wonder if you can sing that song at Foreskin Hill. Take my life Won't you hold it Take my heart, transform it for me, Jesus. Take my mind, mold it to be yours, to be yours, oh Lord, to yours. land in view as we're marching to Zion you pause on the way in you say there's some stuff I gotta make final cuts if the Holy Spirit is doing its job and I know you are right now there are things that you are bringing to our remembrance stuff we don't know how to deal with so we just squash and squelch and push down. And today, Lord, we're asking that you take it over. So make room, Lord. We're coming into the tent. We recognize that the men we get cut with, we will have relationships that will go on for eternity if we will see. So God, make what's on the other side so appetizing that we're willing to cut whatever needs to go. And Lord, those of us who you've called to sharpen flint knives after you've cut on us, help us to realize that shaping and molding is the work of your Holy Spirit. May we recognize, may we pray for, for straight hands and hearts as we deal with men from the inside out. Oh God, won't you do it here in this place? Help us make decisions to make this a safe place. Be with the women 
who love us and support us and are silently saying, shouting their amens from their seats. Can't say it too loud because we'll look at them kind of funny. But inside they're like, yes, God, do it, God. Show them how they can be a support. Show them how they can be patient and not try and cut what you never called them to cut. Ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. The officers will come. If the officers will come forward for the offering. Those of you who are still filling out cards. Put those along with your offering in the offering plate so that we can do our drawing a little bit later on. I'm going to have the word of prayer, and it's a little displaced, but this is where we will do pastor says, and we will have the announcements as the offering is being taken up, and we'll transition. And when I close this prayer, that is a prayer over the offering, this is also the time for our young people quietly go out the door, go downstairs to your Sabbath school class. Let's bow our heads. Father, we come bringing our tithes and our offering, recognizing that the real offering you, you really want from us is the offering of our hearts. So, Lord, we're asking that you would bless what goes into the plate. We ask that you would multiply it. Lord, you know we're trying to do your work here in real and powerful ways, and we need everything that comes. But ultimately, it's, it's our hearts you're after. So as we raise the tithe and offering, I'm asking, Father, that you would take our hearts and minds mold us. Be with the rest of this service and Lord, may our spirits not grow weary with what it is you have in mind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to remind you as a church family of pathways to help that are still coming we're going to be obedient. I was given some, some helpful hints. How many of you have already signed up to be in Pathways to Help? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Church family, let's do better than that. Please, something that needs to be understood. I think there are folks who are believing that this is only for medical personnel. It is not. If you can breathe and smile, have a pulse, we need you. So please, go on to the Union website, and there you will find the link in order to sign up and to get started. Please, the best volunteer positions and things are disappearing even as we speak. So I want our church to be involved in real and powerful ways. <clears throat> this is the point of our service where we are transitioning. We're not done by any stretch of the imagination. We're not done, and if you're hungry, praise the Lord, we're gonna feed you. Say amen. amen. We're gonna feed you by God's grace. There's a lot still to come. We got, we're gonna be here all, we're gonna worship all day long, and it's gonna be powerful. This is the runway, and we're about to take off in just a little while. Also, want to... I'm about, it's 8.30? 8.30. Okay. Women's ministry is meeting tomorrow. Women's ministry is ahead of us. We're trying to catch up with them. Women's ministry is meeting tomorrow, but tomorrow it will meet at 8.30, not 11.30. 8.30, not 11.30. It is a... 
earlier service that they're going to have, uh, and and the directions for it is is up on the on the screen so that you can see those things as they're taking place. Don't want to take up too much time. Uh, I'm hoping that we've all put in our cards. Men, we need to have those cards so that we can get ready to do our drawing. We didn't get to do the drawing on the first time through. We're getting ready to transition and do that drawing in just a little while. And I see, I see it. we're set and ready. All right, we're going to transition into the drawing at this time. Remember, you got to be in the room, men, in order to get one of the, the prizes. We're going to do two in this segment because we didn't do one in the last one. This time. Okay, the blessing of the first drawing is that who says? Who's on? Who's on? Say that. I'm so sorry. His name goes back in the group. The name goes back in there. So sorry. Next one is Vincent. My Nino. My Nino. Vince. Vince. There he Please is. Go. Let's give a hand for Vince. Amen. Green or blue? Oh, you, you're partial to the blue? Okay. All right, here we go. This one is F. F. Yes. Is he in the building? Is he here? He lives on screen. Oh. See? Yeah, they do? Oh, there he is. Come on out. Come on in. He's in the center. Give me a hand, Amen. please. Amen, once again. We can move forward, right? Okay, we'll move forward with worship from here.
Y'all sing that with us. Come on, sing.
your name? Well, I hate to bring this to you that time this year, but my cabinet went out on me. And I was stalling in the back before I came up here because I figured if I was carried around, then maybe the phrase seemed to be one more number. <laughs> it didn't happen. I figured I love it. I'm just glad to be here. And the only reason why I'm here is because of this wonderful pastor. you are special to me, just pay me whatever you want to. So I'm, I'm grateful for that, aren't you? I won't break y'all. Another reason why I'm here is because he told me the makeup of this church. I said, man, I'm going to be at home. He said, it's an African American, Caribbean, Mexican, Colombian, He <laughs> even mentioned a couple of countries, Zimbabwe, and the Shona's in here, and the Metabellis in here, no Mexican, and Jamaica, I'm sorry, in uh, Nigeria, any Igus? No Igus. What about Yoruba? Any Yoruba in here? No? All right. Another reason why I'm glad to be here, because when I get around with your pastor, he makes me feel at home. Because he's really beyond his years. He's a wise young man, like an old man. I just felt relaxed. I could be myself. It reminds, it reminded me when I was running, I ran an evangelistic crusade in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. By the way, I'm not going to preach for 30 minutes, but y'all just, uh, that's all. After 30 minutes, I'll go over a little bit. That's it. All right? Y'all seem relieved. Yeah. <laughs> Around 30 minutes. It reminds me when I was coming from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, I ran a, I ran a breath, an evangelistic crusade down there. And while I was down there, I bought a car from my cousin who owned a car lot. He took me to the auction. I took my car, and my wife flew back, and I drove back. I stopped off in St. Louis to preach for a friend of mine. Put me up in the hotel. I said, Look, in the morning I'll swing by and you can just follow me. I said, Okay. So the Sabbath morning, morning came and he called me. He said, What are you doing? I said, I'm getting dressed. He hung up. He called me right back, getting dressed. He said, You know, you don't dress up in the summertime in this church. You just wear a skirt and some trousers. And that was right down my alley. I didn't have to wear a necktie. You know what I said when I got in front of those people? I said to them, I want to thank you for letting me be myself again. I just want to thank you for letting me be myself again. I didn't complain. I want to thank you for letting me be myself. May I be myself? Thank you. Let's get into the word of God. Is that all right with you? Shall we pray? Father, we just want to thank you for one more day of life, one more privilege, which is ours, to come into your presence, to give you adoration and praise, and to thank you for who you are. And now, Lord, we ask that you would come in and be among us. Let us feel your Holy Spirit. And now, Lord, we also want you to help me to speak with power. Open our ears and hearts that we might comprehend your word. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the book of St. John, what book, everybody? St. John, chapter 5. And I would like to read in your hearing verses, verses 1 through 9. St. John, the fifth chapter beginning at verse 1, on down to verse 9. If you have it, say amen. amen. 
And after this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem, a by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whoever then first after the troubling of the water stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man which was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Wilt thou be made whole? Every the man answered him, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled, to put me into the pool. But while I am coming, another step it down before me. And Jesus said unto him, Rise, and take up thy bed and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and and he walked did what he had to do now I want you to find that for me well I preach without notes how's that now find it for me I'm going to look at it at the end a little bit alright thank you notice in verse 1 of what we just read look at me I'm talking is that alright I'm an evangelist I want people around here I get up. Uh, notice in verse 1 that the text says said that Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now Jerusalem was the focal point and way of life for the Jewish people and economy. It was in Jerusalem that the temple was built more than once. In Jerusalem, in the temple, it was not unusual to find the priest offering up the morning and evening oblation. But once a year, Jews would travel for miles around to go to Jerusalem to take part in the annual feast days. And so, to a Jew, it mattered not from which direction he traveled. He always said, I'm going up to Jerusalem. Perhaps that's what Jesus meant when he said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. How many of you know that there's lifting power in the name of Jesus? Amen. And so Jesus, Joined the caravan band. He became part of the throne that traveled to Jerusalem. But when he got there, he found himself at the pool of Bethesda, which had five porches. And on those porches lay myriad of six folk, the emperor the lame, the halt, those who had lost use of their limbs, those who could not hear, but they were all there for one solitary purpose, and that was to receive healing for the body. They believed that an angel came down and troubled the water. And whoever got into the water first, that person would be healed. They didn't understand it then, but while they were trying to, trying to get into the water, 
The water of life was standing in their very presence. Jesus, Jesus said, I am the water of life. And if any man thirsts, let him come unto me. Don't you know that Jesus is a thirst quencher? Whatever you need, God will provide. Whatever you think you need, God will fix it. And there's nothing you can do so bad that God cannot straighten it out. Yes, he was there among the evident folk. And he wanted to heal them all. But my favorite writer said that had he done so, there would have been such an outcry from the religious leaders until they would have cut his work short. So rather than minimize or limit the scope of his work, Jesus narrowed the scope of his power and focus in on one man. One man who had been sick for 38 years. One man who had been suffering for 38 young, long years. One man who longed for deliverance for 38 years. But now, his deliverance had come. Amen. But Jesus needed an answer to one question. And that question was, will thou be made whole? In other words, do you want to get well? What a ludicrous question. What a ridiculous, ridiculous question. My goodness, the man was sick. He lay on a pallet for 38 years. Strained his eyes, waiting for the, the water to move. What a ridiculous question. Well, everybody don't want to get well. Some people love to be sick. When they're sick, they can manipulate people. Huh? When they're sick, they can control people. When they're sick, they can get people to do what they want them to do. Everybody. Do I have my accent right, New Orleans? That's right. Amen. Everybody. Everybody. That's right. Don't want to get well. Some people love to be sick. <laughs> well, this man was sick. <laughs> Mere fact that Jesus spoke about wellness implies that that was sickness. <laughs> but when you're well, people expect you to behave responsibly. Get a job. Go to work at a decent hour. Show up for work on time. Have a budget. Pay your bills. Everybody. Don't want to get wet. Some people love to be sick. <laughs> Are y'all with me? You're so quiet. I don't know what to say about y'all. Your culture. Come on now. If you don't say amen, I might be here a while. <laughs> you don't want me to do that. Mm -hmm. Everybody don't want to get well, but this man was sick. In fact, no doubt he had given up hope that anything was going to change. He'd been there 38 years, nothing had happened. Going on, going on to year 39, and he was still sick. No doubt, he didn't think anything was going to change. It reminds me of a song, of a song by 
Otis Redding, who said, I'm sitting at the dock of the bay. Y'all don't know all these songs in the church folk. <laughs> Watching the tide roll away. Then in that song, Otis said, nothing seems to change. Everything remains the same. I remember when I was young, and I heard that song, and, and I read about the black scholars in America who said that Otis Redding was describing the plight of black men in America. That's what the scholars said. No matter what we do, nothing seems to change. Everything remains the same. I'm reminded of a book by a young scholar by the name of, his last name was Coles, C-O-L-E-S. I've forgotten his first name. When he was on Good Morning America, what's that other show? Uh, Good Morning America, NBC, whatever, talking about his book. And the title, the title of the book was The Rage of a Privileged People. What he did was this. He interviewed black people who had made it. Black people who worked for Fortune 500 companies. And he said, they all felt the same. They were bitter. That's why it's black folk bitter. He said, they said, we have done what these people asked us to do. I have my law degree from Harvard, my MBA from Princeton, but they still treat me like a Burst. nothing seems to change. Burst. Burst. Everything remains the same. Nothing seems to change. So that man felt that nothing was going to change after 38 years. Just about giving up, giving up. Well, he went on to tell Jesus that when I get there, somebody always step over me. He probably meant they step on, stepped oh, yeah. on him. Yeah. And he was talking about church folk. Yeah. Let me tell you one thing, there's some folk around here right now who believe or don't believe that anything's gonna change. Mm -hmm. The reason why I'm a preacher and a psychotherapist is because I believe you can change. Oh, yes. That's why people pay me well, but I believe things can change, and they can. Mm -hmm. But there are people who come to church, or oh, they put on that smile and say happy Sabbath, and put on that smile and say I'm too stressed to be blessed. <laughs> Some of y'all even get ready for the Sabbath by straightening out things. You straighten out your language. You stop cussing around Friday. <laughs> you get ready for the Sabbath. Huh? I know y'all. Oh, yeah. Don't you do <laughs> You think I say that, didn't you? Did you say that? Yeah, I know. I know people too well. Stop cussing around Friday. The Lord forgive me. <laughs> Help me, people. Stop that. I don't want to cuss. Ah. Uh, Am I preaching the word? Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Amen. May I continue? Yes, sir. Amen. Thank you oh, yes. for letting me mm -hmm. be myself oh, again. Yes. Thank you. I want to thank you all. Well, um, got the, um, cold, the, the, the Fortune 500 people said, nothing's going to change. People coming to church, going through a lot. There's some women I've talked to. He said, well, I, I don't ask for much at all. But I can't even get my knees. I just want to look attention. Can't get my knees back. So I've settled and settled. I've, I've just settled to the fact that he's never going to change. So folk go through life suffering and suffering in silence. In church. Mm -hmm. And I've met parents who, whose children were raised in the church and they're going out there somewhere. And they don't believe that they'll ever come back 
they resigned to the idea that they've lost their child. Let me tell you one thing. You may read about that prodigal son who went to that far country and came back. It's not that easy. I'm telling you what I know. It's hard to come back sometimes when you get caught up in stuff. I work with kids for years. It's rough out there. Even when they come back, they're still damaged. Mm -hmm. Rattled. They need, they, need, they need to be made whole again. And oh, yes. Put back together again like the mm -hmm. potter. It's rough. It's giving them hope. Giving it up. And those church folk, they were the ones that mistreated that man. Let me tell you one thing. Church ought to be different. Amen? Amen. Yes. Amen. I might admire so many folk over here because y'all friends. Amen. <laughs> Too many of our churches are cold places. I have gone in churches, nobody said a word to me. Mm. Come and gone. Not a word. Not one oh, yeah. word. Mm. It's ridiculous. Church ought to be like that. Church ought to be like a hospital where people come in and they're nurtured and cared for. Yeah. And they're discharged into a mean world. They shouldn't have to come to a mean church. Yeah. Church ought to be like a kitchen. Yeah. Where the word of God is baked in urban and prayer. Yeah. Served by the pastor. And we are strengthened and encouraged. Yeah. Oh, yes. And we go out into a mean world. We shouldn't come to a mean church. Yeah. Oh, yes. Should be like that. Should be like that. I did my workshop on um, um, a church on the city. Why black men don't attend church? I talk about churches that grow. Oh yeah, they're friendly churches. Yeah. They're five times more likely to grow than those unfriendly churches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doesn't cost a penny to be friendly. Yeah. Not a dime. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got some stuff to work to do. Hold on, this truth, this truth, man. Folks need to see some truth. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. You know, this country of ours was built on rugged individualism. Which means I got mine, you get yours. Yeah. Rugged individualism will allow. In the richest country in the world, children to go to bed hungry at night. Old folks will buy dog food at the end of the month because they, they can't have any money. They don't have any food. Would allow people to die of curable diseases because they can't afford medical care. That's what rugged individualism would do. When I was a university professor, I taught a course called the History and Policy of Social Institutions. And in that course, I ran into a term called social Darwinism. It has to do with the survival of the fittest. Yeah. And there were people at Harvard University and all these other places who were teaching that People are poor because they're weak. Mm. What nonsense is that? Ignoring the fact that the factory closed down in town. That the jobs are going to Mexico and overseas, but it's your fault. Mm. People talk that nonsense. Social Darwinism. Well, Jesus wanted a yes or no answer from that man. That's all. Do you want to get well? Yes or no? The man began to tell him, Lord, when I get there, somebody, somebody always, yeah, somebody always step over me or on me. Aren't we a doggy dog? Huh? Aren't we some doggy dog? I used to work with kids. I used to go in and out of the school, small kids, on purpose. In fact, I wrote a grant where I worked with kids for 13 years. Every summer, we'd take those black boys. The reading <laughs> scores would go up three and up to five grades. In one month, 20 hours a day, for four weeks, that's all. All we did was read to have them read. Up. That was it. No magic. That's what we did. Every summer. Until I got so tired of I had to travel, I gave it up. But I did write the report, I wrote the research, put it into the funding source. And I was in all these schools, I used to watch those kids at recess. I'd come to see somebody in school. And they would be coming to the same class all together. 
But they will be pushing and shouting, who's going to be first in line? Oh, white people have to be first. I wonder why. I wonder why. Those people stepping on this man, they want him to be first. Mm -hmm. Looking out for themselves. That's what people are. Huh? Yeah. Want to be first. I remember when I bought my Mercedes Benz that I still own. Mm -hmm. It's a 1998 that still drives because yeah. it's paid for. Yeah. Yeah. Remember I had that nice car? <laughs> I stopped at the red light. Young girls trying to hit on me. <laughs> I like your car. Can I ride? No, baby. This is mama. This is a mama. When I get a hug, I'm give me a car. So no, baby, get you a job. Go to school and take care of yourself. That's what I say to them. You know, give that old man advice. Yeah. You Africans can relate to that because as you get older, you're more respected in the business. Huh? Oh yes. You're more respected. Mm -hmm. Not like these Americans over here. This is just people. Well, that's what these boys did, huh? I have heard when I bought my bins, I drove my car, and that was a, I went to a meeting and uh, something training, and there was a principal who saw me. He said, man, I like your car. I said, man, they all the same. They get you from point A to point B. About three months later, we were at another function, a meeting, or some training together, and the same principal, I was leaving, he was talking to me. Well, hold on, hold on. He was talking to me. Hold on, don't go away. I said, I'm talking. I waited around. So he walks me on the parking lot and showed me his car. <laughs> I had an E class, he had an S class. I said, well, this man ain't gonna bother me about a car. <laughs> Do you think I care what you drive? No. But he said, I'll do me. He just, I wasn't thinking about him. <laughs> People just have to be first. They're both people. Mm -hmm. It also reminds me of some women. I talked about children, this man. I've heard women have this conversation. Oh, she does look good now. So let me tell you one thing. When I fix myself up, I can look just as good as her now. Jesus! Hey, with me. Want it? <laughs> a yes or no answer. But he never got it. Yeah. He never got an answer. Jesus said, man, go on. Pick up his bed and walk. And that man picked up his bed and walked. If that would have been me, I would have been running, screaming. Yes! <laughs> oh! I don't know what I would have done. Black folk, y'all know how to act. <laughs> Y'all behave like that during the week. <laughs> I can go off on I'm not gonna get off on good time. I get I get the whole sermon on that stuff. But let me say this to you. Jesus still wants an ask yes or no answer to black men. Did you know according to the United States Public Health Services, the annual death rate of African black men, American men of African descent is Lifestyle, 50%. Heredity, 25%. Environment, 15%. And medical system mistake, only 10%. 50% of why black men die so soon is because of lifestyle. Now, let me go somewhere with this. Now, what the research does not Show a measure is stress. Black men in America have more stressors than any other uh, 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 demographic group. Stress is more pronounced when you're in a situation where you have where you have no control over what's going to happen to you. That is stress provoking, like slavery. Man couldn't protect his wife and children because he had no control over what happened to him. Let me just pick a country and chat on that a while. Jamaica. Slavery in Jamaica lasted for 300 years. Just about as long as it did in America. At which time people were raped, maimed, emasculated, and dehumanized. However, in Jamaica there were a group of Africans called the Maroons. And the Maroons 
fought back. They won every battle and skirmish that was in that country. Because the terrain in Jamaica was similar to Africa. They would camouflage themselves and in leaves and stand still like trees. And when the British soldiers would come by, they cut their throats. At one point, the French hired the Marines to fight the British, and they did and won. But after every battle is over, there's always a treaty. And the Maroons agreed to two things among, among others. They agreed, they agreed, number one, to wear uniforms, and number two, they agreed to return runaway slaves, and they did. In fact, at one time, there were so many African slaves in Jamaica until, until the slave traders, slave traders omitted Afri Africa, and they just brought slaves from Jamaica to America. Now, I'm going to leave slavery alone, because I know some of y'all are not comfortable with it. So let me say this to you. May I kindly say this? Mm -hmm. The mind of the slave master has not changed. It raises its head in the form of the Confederate flag flying in state capitals right now. The Confederate flag was a symbol of hate. People were willing to shed blood and die to own other human beings. That's because the mind of the slave master has not changed. The mind of the slave master has not changed because we have what we call Racial profiling, driving while black, uh, walking while black, you don't care what kind of accent you speak with, shopping while black, they follow you around as if you want to steal something. That's a slave master's mind. And I'm going to say this kindly. We have an attorney general with that kind of mind. The man was not appointed some years ago as judge because he voted against the Voting Rights Act. Didn't want black folks to vote. Now he's our attorney general with the mind of a slave master. And I'm not going to talk about the president because some of y'all voted for him. I got a lot of things I can preach about besides that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I could. I'm not going to do that. In spite of all that, my friends, in spite of all of that, black men still need to say yes or no to certain things. Yes to proper diet. No to alcohol abuse. Yes to enough rest. No to drugs, illicit drugs. Yes to a relationship with a good woman. Let me tell you what I read in the professional journal article. That a man who's in a good relationship with a woman can add 20 years to his life. Amen. 20 years! <laughs> Maybe that's why I don't look my age at 75. <laughs> I don't know. I don't feel it. <laughs> Let me tell you about a good woman. I can't speak for everybody else. Let me just tell you about a sister. May I? Uh, let me just say this. She is delicious. Taste her. She's lovely. Love her. She's intelligent. Learn from her. She's radiant. Bask in her. She's a gem. Reflect in her. She's priceless. Value her. She's an asset. Take stock in her. She saw cuddle with her. Mm -hmm. She's sexy, experience her. She's nurturing, appreciate her. Uh, she's meaningful, cherish her. She's strong, gain strength from her. She's forgiving, seek her forgiveness. She's all that, standing off of her, all of her. She's spiritual. Worship with her. She's sensitive. Comfort her. She's joyful, rejoice with her. She's funny, laugh with her. She's expressive, listen to her. She's purpose-driven, unite with her. 
She's dependable. Depend on her. She's trustworthy. Trust her. She's human. Expect that from her. 20 years, brother. Just 20 years. I'm going to talk tomorrow morning about things my father never told me in the morning. And I'm going to talk about these things right here, about picking the right woman. You might have a woman, she may be wonderful laying down. Mm. But standing up, she can call and then go, oh, this ready. There's so much misery. <laughs> She's wonderful laying down. Standing up! <laughs> All right, man. Just a taste. Just a taste of it. May I just see? I see. You laugh. <laughs> well, 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 well. Black men died too soon. As of this year, uh, the African American male lives 64.6 years compared to the black woman who lives 73.7 years. White man, 73.1 years. The white woman, 79.5 years. A difference of around from 10 to 15 years. Black men, African American, black men die. Black men have the highest uncontrollable hypertension rate in the world. Disease of the heart take about 38,000 of us. Cancer kills another 33,000. AIDS kills 13,000 a year. Homicide, 9,000. Black folks come out. Well, black people kill each other. That's true. That's true. 93% of us are killed. Black men are killed by other black men. But what these people don't tell you, I'm going to tell you today, 84% of white people kill each other. Do you ever hear that? Mercy. 84! Mercy. You don't hear that. Pneumonia, 4,000 a year. Chronic obstructive, obstructive pulmonary disease and related conditions, 4,000 a year. Annually, 20,000 black men die from AIDS or homicide. That is 55 a day, once every 30 minutes for the most part. It comes from self-destructive behavior. Their behavior has been programmed and sustained by historical and current barrage of social, economic, and educational, physical, and psychological hurdles designed to limit, retard, and in some cases eliminate the progress or potential of African-American males. One example of this inability is black men not allowed to vote after they have done their time. In several states, you can't vote. Who ever heard of that? That means others have to make decisions for them. All they can do is stand on the back, on the side of the, uh, on the, on the porch or on the dock of the bay, watching while other people make decisions for them. Powerless. Impotent. To make decisions that affect their lives. That's what we have. And this brings us back. I'm winding down now. It's all right if I wind down? May I? This brings us back, 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 back. I like to go back every now and then to the scripture where it says, In these days lay a great number of sick folk, paralyzed, quivered up, clearly. African-American males are disproportionately sick, disabled, hospitalized, incarcerated, unemployed, blocked up, locked up, locked out, locked in. Large numbers of males are counted among the sick of different diseases. And friends, we have the answer. We've got to do something about it to make a difference. I'm going to talk about the advantages have men in the church. You know when you got men in the church, the church is broke. Amen. Our little girls get married. Did you know that? I thought that was mine. Our little girls need husbands. Our middle aged women need husbands. Our mature women need husbands. I didn't say old women. I said mature. They want they want somebody too. <laughs> and you have men in here, you got a Christian man that can marry. Huh? That's why we need to make a difference. 
You know, that man believed that they, their, their theology back at the pool was to wait. In other words, just wait until the moving of the water. Just lay there and wait. Well, my theology says go. Go with you there for the dog world. Huh? Go show, your, show yourselves to the priest. Go your way and sin no more. Go tell Peter to meet me in Galilee. Friends, God wants us to make a difference and start some things. To make some changes in this church. That's why I want everybody here when I talk about why black men don't attend church. Everybody needs to be here. But we need to make some adjustments to attract black men, or any man for that matter. And we're going to talk about that. So, Jesus was used to bless this man's life and make, made all the difference in the world after 38 long years. So that's a sign that we shouldn't give up. Yeah. 38 years is nothing. 40 years. And the thing I like about you never get too old to be used by God. Amen. Amen. God can use anybody. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was too old. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. God can use anybody. Leah was ugly, Joseph was a beauty. <laughs> Moses had a stuttering problem. Gideon was scared. Samson had long hair and was a womanizer. Moses had a stuttering problem. Um, Rahab was a prostitute. Jeremiah and Timothy were too young. David had an affair and was a murderer. Elijah was, was suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Jonah ran from God. Naomi was hmm, a widow. Job went bankrupt. Peter denied his Lord three times. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Hmm? Martha worried about everything. Mary Magdalene was a... Hmm. The Samaritan woman was divorced more than once. That chaos was too small. Paul and Timothy were too religious. And Lazarus was dead. So, so, the next time you feel that God can't use you, remember that. Amen? Amen. I'm so glad that Jesus can change anybody. Can he? Can he do it? My Lord can take a hit man and make him a hit, did he? He can change a street walker to a soul star. A carpet crook into a camp meeting cook. He can make a drug dealer a hard healer. Club dancer a hope enhancer. A bartender a faith defender. A pervert a convert, a con man. Jesus handyman, a sex offender to full surrender. Jesus can change a pimp to a priest, playboy to an altar boy, homosexual to an intercessor, a man who is gay and make him say, Lord, I will obey. Amen. He can assign a thief to much relief, an unbelieving spouse to God's remnant house. I told Jesus, it'll be all right if you change my name. Well, through it all, I could hoop with y'all ain't ready for that yet. <laughs> through it all. Well, well, I have learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. Amen. Will you join me today? Amen. Will you join me with all your heart and bring your bodies here and invite somebody? Oh, use your cell phone to come out here and help us. Get some men in the church. God bless you. Amen. Anybody here is not a member? Anybody here not a member of the church? I want to see you. Anybody who's not a member, raise your hand. Where are you from, honey? Uh, are you a Sabbath Are you a Sabbath in Alabama? Do you remember? 
you remember? I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Okay. You're not a baptized child yet, man? Okay. God bless you. I got something to say to you. Who else is not a member of this church? Right. Okay. Let me say this to you. May I look in your eyes and just talk to you? You ought to join this church to sell the reason. I'm not talking about spiritual stuff. First, I'm talking about sell the reason. Number one, people in this church live longer than anybody on the face of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> Number two, they have fewer strokes and fewer heart attacks in this church. All right? That means you'll be around for the grandchildren and all. Another reason is Jesus said, if you love me and love me enough, I'm going to add to that. You will keep my commandments. I will invite you to become a commandment, to become a believer of and join this church. Would you do that? Will you say yes to me? Who will say yes to me? Give her a hand. She said yes to me. Hallelujah. 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 Praise Amen. God. Ah. Praise God. She said yes to Jesus. She wanted to become a member. God bless you. The rest of y'all take care of me and I'll take care of you. All right? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me come in here and enjoy myself. God bless you. Amen. Amen. audiovisual people, uh, Amen. all the work that went into getting the, the presentation and all the stuff needed, and just putting on today and making it a successful day. We still have a way to go, so let's let's do the benediction and we'll move forward. Father, well, I want to thank you for today and, and just what it means to you and, and your people and your men about how we need to touch and continue to help us in our own lives. So we can continue to go into the promised land. We thank you for just this time.
time you have and the ability that we can go and make a difference and that as men we can be an example to our wives, our other ladies, our children and all we do. Continue to bless us today and all we are doing, our food that we have to take up, bless those who prepared it and the fellowship we have together. We love you. Continue to take care of us. Let your face shine on us and your grace and peace and mercy overflow. And it's because of your son and his love. And may we answer yes when we're called. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.